in these models, there are like negative components, which are just like unhelpful for induction tasks. By corrupting them, you just still make them do other tasks, but you can just completely destroy them with zeroing out. Welcome back. In this part, we're going to be talking about how we measure how well these techniques actually work, and in particular, how you guys operationalized this idea of actually measuring how good a circuit is, and mm. various conceptual problems that come up with trying to measure this and trying to do automatic circuit discovery and ways people can build on this. So yeah, we have this figure, you have lines, and you have squares, and you have things, and it sure seems like I'm supposed to look at this and be like, red line is higher than green line and blue line, thus ACDC good. Yeah. What am I looking at? What is this? That would be the ideal story, but unfortunately, <laughs> life is complicated, and I hate things it. don't work out as well as you hope. But it is still the case that uh, we have... Uh, a way to compare different circuit recovery methods that had previously not been done in the literature. And this is to some extent because the like de facto way of doing like a mechanistic interpretability is to do like a case study on one particular like explanation that you found of some interesting phenomena. And this is great. And this is like not something we did in ACDC at all, but it doesn't lead you to see like how well you did compared to some like standard at all. And so when we have this automated setup, we can now benchmark like at scale how these different methods are doing at picking up on the sort of ground truth circuits that's present in these models. And so we did that for all our three methods across all the tasks that we discussed by running them across many different thresholds for ACDC and many different parameter configurations for the other methods and then measuring what the rate of recovery of the edges in those circuits was. So yeah, that's the high-level summary of what's uh, happening here. And so here the ground truth is just like, we have the IOI paper, they did a bunch of manual analysis. Let's sure hope they were correct. Yep. So Makes this sense. is where we assume that existing work has said this is a model and this is the subgraph that does a particular task. So I will bring up the pane I brought up before where the IOI paper claimed that this is the set of heads as well as the NLPs in the model that are able to do the IOI task. So they gave us a diagram of the edges present and then we can just re-implement this with this horrifically large diagram and say that these are the connections that are present for the IOI task. And all the other connections in GPT-2 small, remember there are 32,000 of them, so there's a vast number of connections not present here, are not in GPT-2, uh, are not in the IOI circuit. And then with this assumption that there's a ground truth from the like IOI paper in this case, then we can run some auto circuit discovery methods and we can look at the true positive rate, so how many nodes they re correctly recover compared to the total number of nodes that they are like rate as are, like recovered in the circuit. So the true positive equals the true positive divide number of nodes divided by the true positive nodes plus the false negative nodes. And then we can also measure the false positive rate of the method. And so the false positive rate uh, is equal to the false positive number of edges divided by the number of false positive edges plus the true negative edges. And this is then way to compare how well algorithms perform because the higher up you are, so the top left, the better your like technique is doing. The higher your true positive rate is, the lower your false positive rate is. Gotcha. So just to try to unpack this, uh, if something is in the top left, that means it's got true positive one and false positive zero, yep. which means if there's 50 ground truth edges, this thing has found exactly 50 edges and they are all the true one mm -hmm. and none of the false ones. That's if it had found 500 edges of which 50 were the true ones and there's a thousand edges total, then it would be true positive rate one. It would be at the top and then it would be around false positive rate 50% because there's just like lots of edges in there that don't matter. And it's kind of unclear how much we care about the trade-off between these two things. Like maybe we're pretty happy to have lots of true positives, to have lots of false positives as long as we get the true positives. But it seems kind of intuitive that like 
we really care about getting as many of the true edges as possible, and we want fewer false positives if possible. So, like, why is true positive rate not enough on its own? I mean, because you can get uh, true positive rate one with false positive rate one by just including every single possible edge, right? We need to have some inclusion of, like, lower false positive, right? Yeah, exactly. And the way I think about it, there's like this Pareto frontier where you can be more permissive and accept more edges, and you will get more of the true circuit, but you will also get more fake things. <laughs> and it's not clear where, and for any given level of like how many edges you want, you can imagine setting the relevant, setting the appropriate threshold and like getting the right circuit. You always want to get the best. If you can improve one of these, keeping the other ones the same, you're happy. But it's kind of not obvious where on this frontier you want to be. As long as you're moving up and to the left, it's like kind of unclear where you want to be along the spectrum. And so it's kind of hard to compare these methods. I guess one thing that's kind of being alighted is like there's some really important edges and there's some less important edges. Mm -hmm. And true positive rate kind of alights that. This is true. Yeah. And I think, yeah, this is, we're not claiming this is the, like, one metric to compare different circuits, but it at least gives us, like, a comparison across different regimes, such as, uh, like, this regime where there's, like, a very low false positive rate, so we're basically just picking up signal rather than, like, noise. And in this regime, for example, the, like, ACDC method is very effective, but then at, like, in a different regime where we're trying to just pick up as many of the true positives as possible and don't care about a pretty, very large false positive rate, we have, like, a somewhat different story, and, like, the subnetwork probing method is, like, better in this uh, regime in most of the cases. And so this provides like a comparison across different like thresholds of how many edges we're like throwing into our circuits, which is like different across the sort of like different tasks you're trying to explain. So uh, this does provide like a comparison at like several different scales that I, I, I quite like at least. Um, what's with the various crosses below the lines in the IOI graph? Yep, that's a mm. good point. This is mentioned in the caption that we don't see that like uh, methods, when you change their parameters, always produce results that are on the Pareto frontier. So this set of like crosses, they're green crosses for subnetwork probing, are cases where we ran the subnetwork probing algorithm and we got like a value for the false positive rates and the true positive rates, which were actually worse than the Pareto frontier of all possible circuits that could be recovered. But presumably because of local optima or some just weirdness, uh, we got these like failure cases. And so we thought it was worth like highlighting a few. And this occurred with like ACDC and like the doctrine example here, for example, because this is worth pointing out that you're not necessarily going to get a Pareto optimal point when you run these auto circuit discovery algorithms. Right. Like you change the threshold and maybe you just get something which is worse because yep. it's a bit janky and noisy. Is there a notion of random seed in these algorithms? Um, yep, the, I think we just ran, like, one particular seed, uh, but, yeah, in, like, appendix experiments, we ran on, like, a held-out, like, test set of examples, so we have some, like, checking of uh, seed dependence, I suppose, but not in this particular figure. Um, it seems like you could also use some metric which is, like, what is the KLS divergence for a fixed number of edges or something like that? Does what do you mean by a fixed number? You mean like for a particular uh, subgraph? So we we take a method and we take the top thousand edges it says matter. I actually don't know if that's a thing you can do. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's a thing you could do with something like HIS. I don't know if yeah, you could do that. Unless you do that. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, we haven't like done edge-based evaluations with gradients in this paper, but it's certainly like in the code base, so this could be done. Yeah, so you can do like take the top thousand edges that matter, that's your subgraph, now evaluate the KL divergence and like see how close to zero it is. Mm -hmm. To me that's like, I don't know, my intuition for how I'd evaluate this, like for a given level of complexity, how good is it at the actual ground truth metric? Yeah, so this was like uh, the second evaluation approach that we took ah, when we you have a were, we zoomed in on the induction task which is a, crucially a task where you don't, there isn't really a ground truth for the induction circuit in this particular like open source model. 
since a number of groups studied this model of like the remix program, but found induction is like somewhat like distributed across both induction heads and several different pathways in the model. And so we use this as a case where you would want another form of evaluation for your like auto circuit discovery methods, which is just looking at, well, how many like edges did your method recover? And at this number of edges recovered, what was the KL divergence of that subgraph to the original model? And so, yeah, uh, as described, uh, we tried this experiment and did it on like held out data points to ensure that our methods weren't like overfitting to the data we were feeding them as well and found like uh, broadly good signs of negative correlation and uh, slight better performance of ACDC compared to the other approaches. Ah, yeah, and here you want to be low down rather than high up because low KL divergence means there's no change. Yes, yep, so sorry, to make that clear, yeah, this is again, this should be a Pareto frontier because of noisiness, there's a little bit of like weirdness with all the methods, I think, but uh, you want to have a low KL divergence as well as a low number of edges. So going down and left is best here because this means you have a tiny sparse subgraph which basically approximates the model. Ah, and here it's not that you're saying you're allowed to use a thousand edges, it's more just like you try a bunch of thresholds and you just put the point on as a scatter plot and you can yeah, mentally right. fill in the Pareto frontier. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'd love to see this for the other ones. Yeah, I think those are all in the appendix. Like we have the evaluations for those. Uh, I guess I worth pointing out as well that we have a log scale on the number of edges because of the fact that there are like 300 edges in this two layer model, but you're not like you're trying to find really small subgraphs in general. And so you don't want like half your like plots to be filled with more than half of the edges of your subgraph present. So a log scale is yep. just slightly nicer there to emphasize that like the reason we sort of care about is where we've stripped away a ton of edges. We only have like 20 to 50 left, but uh, this is still where things are most important because you can get pretty close to like zero KL with just 20 to 50 edges in this case, for example. Yeah, there's something I really like about seeing the shape of these graphs. It seems to me like the kind of vertical drop you get on the right is like, ah, that is the point that is the minimum number of edges you need for this circuit. Yeah, and, and I guess it's, like it's something qualitative. It's worth noting that it did surprise us at first that zero ablation is just able to get much sparser subgraphs, funny enough, than a random ablate, like a corrupting ablation, which was extremely surprising to us on like first look, because most of the existing claims have suggested that like corruption ablation and settings to like a patching distribution just doesn't really like break your model that much, but zero ablation could. And it seems that we can get like just reminding the viewers of the difference between zero and corrupted corrupted sure, is so. like you replace with the you replace a head's output with its output on another input zero is you just delete it you set it to zero you remove the term thanks neil for the summary and for nudging me there so this is surprising because like the work of like a series of posts called uh, causal scrubbing, as well as like own experience with the other tasks such as ioi and the greater than task suggests that it's generally a better idea to use a corrupted distribution rather than just zero stuff out. And the claim in like the causal scrubbing work is that you could be throwing models off distribution by setting them to zero activations in places. But in this case, we found that setting activations to zero in this induction circuit was actually better for getting low KL divergence to the original model compared to corrupting those uh, activations. And so our theory here is that like it's plausible that like in these models there are like negative components which are just like actively like unhelpful for induction-y tasks. And by corrupting them, you just still make them do these like other tasks, but you can just completely destroy them with zeroing out. And so that's one of our guesses about like why it might be better to zero ablate, because maybe you want to have more destructive tools, but it is a surprising result to us. So we're not sure what's happening here. Yep, I am very surprised by this. I have no idea how to interpret it. I'm yep. still concerned you have a bug. I don't think this has been re re reproduced several times, so I bet against it. But yeah, there, there, there could be some weird explanation here. I'm not sure what's happening. My best guess is something along the lines of it is just the case from the model's perspective that, like, a bunch of its components doing stuff that's irrelevant for induction. 
setting them to zero makes them easier to ignore than corrupting them. Mm-hmm. It would be interesting to try mean ablation as well. Yeah, so yeah. That graph. We haven't tried that one, but uh, yeah, that could be a future work. Anything else to say when it comes to metrics and benchmarking these methods? Yeah, I think that's basically my full thoughts on two approaches to like benchmarking methods. But I guess the common thing across both these methods is like Pareto optimality rather than like point optimality. And I think this is like fairly important in interpretability because from like experience in models, you rarely have just like the part of the model that does the thing and the part that just does not do it. There's always like a long tail of components which are like partially doing some part of the task to a lesser and lesser extent as you go down the long tail. And so I think it would be like good for future work to be thinking more about like the Pareto optimality of the explanations of models rather than just did we find the circuit or did we not find the circuit, if that makes sense. That makes sense. Awesome. Should we move on to discussing the various kinds of pathological things that make measuring how good your circuit is hard? Sure. Like That's negative good. and backup hits? Hmm. So, yeah. Do you maybe want to begin by explaining what a negative component is? Sure. One component that can arise in models that can cause problems for these automated circuit approaches is negative heads that uh, can be illustrated here in the case of the IOI circuit, but they are more general. And I believe the dog string circuit contains a similar example as the negative heads in IOI and have been observed in like a large number of models of different sizes. And these heads um, surprisingly write against the like correct completion for the task at hand. So they are like actively unhelpful because they decrease the model's probability on the correct completion. This can be problematic for circuit discovery because one of the naive ways you could try and find components is to optimize for as high a score on some metric of task behavior as possible. If you do this, then you're likely to just have your optimizer throw out the negative heads. And then if you are doing a comparison, such as our comparison, where you look at how well it like recovers the edges, you will lose badly because there'll be lots of edges missing. So that's the phenomena of negativity and why it can cause some problems for these uh, auto, auto circuit approaches. Yeah, just to kind of unpack that a bit, the problem is when we're measuring something like logit diff, this applies less with things like KL divergence. You can get good logit diff by deleting bits of the model that are actively unhelpful to the task. Mm. And if you delete half of the real circuit and also all of the bits that are actively unhelpful, this can look exactly the same as getting the full circuit, including the negative bits. But in some sense, it's like cheating. I kind of think of KL divergence as a way of partially getting around this. Yeah, and I, I completely agree and think that like this problem is like a fairly big deal. It, it doesn't, it's not like, oh, it's like kind of cheating to me. It feels like there's like you fundamentally messed up if this has gone on because the goal to me of this like circuit and style interpretability is to try and like reduce this complex like neural network into a like manageable subset that reflects its behavior. But a crucial thing there was that you needed to do your reduction in a way that reflected behavior. Otherwise, you've just like created a new task, a new model that's not like tied to reality of what you cared about to begin with. And so I personally am pretty interested in interpretability to be able to explain like the huge language models that just can do so many things that we don't understand. But if our like interpretability is really extracting completely unfaithful, like unrepresentative subsets of those models that do things in just different ways, then I think it's mostly failing in the goal of making interpretability useful for like actually understanding language models. So that's uh, my take on why that like this should be a serious pause for thought with regard to missing components in models. Nice. And yeah, you actually have some cool forthcoming work investigating what's actually up with negative name mover heads. Do you want to briefly summarize some of the key takeaways for that as a sneak preview of what I'm sure will be your third appearance on this channel. Sure. So with collaborators uh, such as Callum McDougall and Cody Rushing, we've been trying to figure out why models would even generate these negative components that seem to actively write against completions 
because this sure is surprising. Like, uh, if you've been confused about this explanation, I think this is probably a good reaction because it would it's seem in advance that if models didn't want to have a certain completion made, they would probably just learn to output that completion less. But empirically, it seems that they learn negative heuristics. So they write some positive part and then some negative part. And the current explanation, which we're working towards getting figured out, is that these negative name mover heads in this example are responding through their query inputs to a confident prediction, a confident unembedding coming from the name mover heads. So this diagram is actually flawed in some ways because the negative heads actually should be off to the right of this block here because they solely respond to like the confident predictions in the model to then decrease the confidence on those predictions. And this mechanism doesn't occur for like all words. It occurs for certain words that the model seems to be overconfident in and they need some calibration components. And in upcoming work, we hope to show that this head here, like head 10.7, this copy suppression, where it picks up on a copied prediction and then suppresses it, uh, is the single main role that this head has on all of the like GPT-2 small training distribution. So I'll, I'd keep an eye out for upcoming work on this because despite being a pretty bizarre phenomena, we think we have some idea about what's going on with uh, negative heads on the whole distribution. Uh, awesome. Yeah, I am super excited about that paper. And that makes me more optimistic that we can resolve the negative heads parts problem by just like identifying these copy suppression heads. One of my favorite results of the paper, of the forthcoming paper, is that anti-induction heads, which are induction heads that like systematically do the wrong thing, and negative name mover heads are exactly the same heads, which is just like a very nice resolution of two seemingly unrelated mysteries at once. Uh, though there's also negative, systematically negative MLPs sometimes, and I think we're a lot more confused about what's up with that. Mm. All right, mm. we've also got these backup heads, mm. which have been better fleshed out in a recent paper called The Hydra Effect. What's up with mm. that, and why does that make automatic circuit discovery hard? So we've discussed how negative heads could be a slight problem for some naive circuit discovery methods, but there are also these heads called backup heads, which we'll describe have somewhat deeper problems for circuit discovery algorithms. So what is a backup head? Well, a backup head are these empirically observed model components that don't do anything in the normal model, but then want some like upstream components. So components that came before them have been ablated, so like removed or corrupted, then these backup heads kick in and start doing useful things to the model. So this is exactly what you'd expect sort of backup to mean. They like respond to removal of earlier components. And this is problematic for circuit discovery because often we're looking at like how big is the effect of a given model component, like how big is its effect in like one particular subgraph. So the ACDC algorithm, for example, just looks at like how important is this edge in the context now, when we remove it now, and backup shows that the importance of edges changes depending on the like structure and the presence of certain like nodes in the subgraph. This is like sad because this is like a substantial difficulty for understanding models that doesn't wouldn't have no one would have like guessed would have occurred in advance really. But uh, the existing methods have some ability to pick up backup heads, but uh, we don't. It's like certainly an issue that these naive methods are not designed with um like a backup in mind at all. One question I guess I'd have is like so I know backup is a really big deal when you're doing node level patching. Like you delete an attention head, a name of a head, and then the backup heads take over, and the overall logics look the same. But if you're doing path patching, it's less obvious to me it's a big deal. Mm. Because you start from the outputs, you patch the edge to the backup heads. The <laughs> backup head is off, so that edge goes. And then you patch the edge to the real head. The real head matters, and so that edge remains. Yeah, I think this is... Uh, we don't get any like chaotic behavior like you do in normal models where you can perform some ablations and suddenly um, 
like the model just is the same because a bunch of backup happens. But I think it is an issue for circuit discovery because this described workflow, which certainly happens with ACDC, that you will firstly look at connections to backup heads and oh, they don't matter, throw them out. And then you'll look at connections to like name mover heads and oh, they matter, so we'll keep them. So you don't do like really badly. You don't just miss everything, but you do miss the backup heads. Like the method that will say like this head just isn't useful at all. And plausibly, you wanted to explain the backup head because it was capable of doing the task. So like that's like the worry. But ACDC doesn't like, yeah, I agree that being edge related doesn't mean you like completely like lose to like the node patching failure cases. All right. Any other pathologies and models that make circuit discovery hard? Um, yeah, I guess the the frustrating thing is that almost all our evaluations have some great successes, like on IOI and Graceband, for example, but we do have failures, like on this doc string example on the KL divergence metric is extremely, like, poor. And so a frustrating thing is that we've, like, tried some approaches to, like, unifying the sort of circuit discovery methodologies, but just nothing works in uh, all cases. So I think if I jump here, when you look at like the optimization of the doc string metric, suddenly performance is great again and things work in this case. But a frustrating thing is that things seem very dependent on, did you use uh, your corrupted activations or your zero activations? And did you use the correct metric? And of course, when you're in the circuit discovery process, you don't know whether you're using the correct thing or not. So it would be nice to get a better handle on why these failures are happening and if there are approaches that fix failures in general. One of my takeaways from all this is just, man, the stuff's fucking cursed. You should just try lots of stuff and like see if it's consistent or not. Does that seem like the right takeaway? I think this seems right. Like, it would be nice if there was a way you could do things where you just clicked play and ran your circuit discovery thing once and, like, bam, we know what's happening here. Let's get on with the rest of our interp. But in reality, this will look like an iterative process where you'll probably run this circuit thing once and then you'll be a bit confused by some part that's missed. So you'll rerun with a different data set and it will be more back and forth than just end to end optimized. And I think this was like empirically what like happened with uh, early work with researchers doing some gendered pronouns where they were refining their hypothesis based on tweaking uh, like different thresholds that ACDC would have. Uh, output for their like given circuits so uh yeah i think that sadly just the dream of just totally end-to-end -to -end interpretability is still a long way off but uh i think uh it's good to build like good tools to get faster at some parts of the process and i hope that, that this is a contribution of the work all right do you want to close by talking about future work you want to see sure so a question that is natural given like the sort of setup here where there's a bunch of ways of evaluating circuit discovery approaches and a bunch of improvements as discussed like already for a very simple baseline the question like to ask here is well what's like the most reasonable thing to do next and i think what i'm most excited about is like using these edge related discoveries so the way to like frame transformer computational graphs as edge based transformer graphs with residual streams to like port this idea to the existing methods such as the gradient descent methods on masks because the gradient descent methods so far have just been on uh, like nodes and i think one of the most promising things is to get like the edge based methods working with like a gradient descent over masks and I think this could be like very strong as a method and it would be fucky because it has a ton of parameters, but this feels to me like the natural way to go because it could then potentially be scaled up to larger models and then like auto circuit discovery on large models could genuinely find stuff that was just like too much work for humans to do that I'm particularly excited about. Awesome. I mean, my attribution patching post does have a section where I get path patching to work. Um, it just does. It's really fast, pretty easy to code and I open source code for it. So maybe this is already done. <laughs> I mean, I think that all of the methods in this paper, I think there's still like a substantial amount of human time there to go from like, okay, here's my first path patch. 
okay, here's my second path patch, here's my third path patch, and then then you're like starting to get moving with like quite interesting circuits. And so I think that there is something slightly more about like these auto circuit discovery methods, because they don't like path patch one by one, like they hopefully give you something at the end without any intervention from you that is through like several different layers of a model. So that still feels like somewhat beyond just like patching methods for me at this point. I guess, so to me, the dumbest version would be you attribution path patch everything individually, and then you sort, and then you mask out all the edges below a certain threshold. But anyway, one thing that seems interesting to me is like, I was quite surprised that the gradient descent based methods were like kind of a single step, like just let's extrapolate out from the current gradient what would happen if you just like jumped all the way to the end. And a thing which I think would be pretty cool is like actually doing like learning a continuous mask and like actually doing gradient descent on that, especially if you have some kind of random initialization of the premises and like just understanding things like if you initialize them as all ones versus all zeros, how does that affect things? Does gradient descent actually make sense? Like one empirical test someone could go do is just take some head and patch it out 50% see whether that is in fact like half the effect of patching that fully and this would be a very easy empirical test as far as my know it's actually run yeah i think this is more concrete more like um human in the loop than like auto circuit discovery but i agree that like seeing what the lost landscape actually looks like is like a pretty pressing problem because if this like lost landscape between corrupted and, and clean data points is super linear then it just gives us a lot more faith in the sort of like attribution patching style approaches or if there are like pathologies that we haven't realized, then it'd be like exciting to see work on that. I've heard from like speaking with the author Stefan that like these attribution patching methods are like fairly unsuccessful in the doc string task for, for not known reasons. And so this could be a cool example where people could look at what the, the curve between the loss curve between corrupted and clean looks like and why the gradients just at the, the clean points uh, fails to approximate that drop in. Um, yeah, I think this is like pretty exciting as well. Nice. Another thing I'd love is for someone to go and just try to speed up the recursing over edges stage using attribution patching to just do the gradient based path patching on all the edges and use that as a heuristic. Since I think that, sh that should be like a massive speed up at the cost of being like, well, it's a gradient based approximation, so it's kind of sketchy. Yeah, yeah, I agree. This is like um, doable now as well. Yeah. I also think that like, while we're on the subject of like, for the tasks i think there's like a lot of excitement about like actually looking for like dangerous capabilities of models like on the inside through approaches like this that i like would like love to see work in like presumably like larger models so like i was like listening to the the lian Leica atk podcast and he was excited about for example these like higher levels of interpretability where you get a model to like tell you the truth a bunch of times and then lie to you and then see which parts of the network are lighting up in deceptive mode and when they're in like lighting up in lying mode. And this is exactly this formalism of like, you have a clean distribution and a corrupted distribution. And like what gives you the highest score while like moving a bunch of stuff, well, it's keeping some stuff on the like the corrupt distribution and keeping some stuff on the cleanest distribution. So I think that like some high level interpretability of like, what does the structure of the model look like when like it's doing certain dangerous capabilities is another Another thing that this like auto approach could open up. That seems super cool. One of my favorite examples of a thing that I'd love to see someone go do in, in this vein is like, why does Bing chat gaslight users? Like the broader thing of like, take a model that does stuff that seems bad and we don't know why it does it and try to find a circuit behind this mm. as a step towards understanding why this happens seems like one of the ways I could see Mechantub actually being genuinely useful in practice in a way that fits really well in this distribution dependent specific Mechantub framework. Yeah, and I think um, another example of this is the examples of sycophancy, which I believe you can get like data sets for now that show you that model outputs change when you preface your inputs by saying your political beliefs or certain biases you have. And this is clearly a case where the model must be moving like context from the early part of the prompt about who the user is and their political interests to the late stage of the prompt. And some understanding into this like moving of information from the like context to the actual models like claims about reality could be pretty great if we could understand where and when this happens for like better targeted interventions into models to like change how they behave. 
So yeah, this is another thing where if we can scale Mechinterp, there are just a bunch of stuff that could like open up and be pretty exciting to get more interventions and the models working. Nice. One project pitch I would be interested in someone doing is just taking your existing code and going and trying to speed run, finding as many circuits as you can in GPT-2 small. Like, I would bet that in a weekend, someone could go and find, like, five new IOI star circuits. And we have, like, three that you just cover in this paper. It's terrible. <laughs> like, why do we not have an enormous data set of, like, 20? Mm. So that the next time someone tries doing ACDC, we can be like, ah, here is a large data set of interesting circuits we can go and investigate. Mm. One thing I would love to see is ACDC applied on neurons. Mm. This has, like, the major problem that... The neuron basis is like not obviously privileged, mm. meaning because models engage in behaviors like superposition, they may not use individual neurons as like their units of computation, and may instead use distributed combinations of neurons. But there are some settings where individual neurons are used, like we covered in my neurons in the haystack walkthrough, like the French neuron. I would just be excited to see if it actually works for studying individual neurons. And what kinds of computational hacks people can come up with to speed it up? Yep, and we have a code base which is like supportive of like neuron splitting. So I would also like to see this on language models, since we only tested this on like the tracer models. Oh, you actually did neuron level stuff. Yep, for the super small tracer models, we had like a case where we could get like the neuron by neuron breakdown of the circuits. I think there's an example here where we could get the Q at this frac previous token. Uh, nice. Note that this is a very different use of neuron splitting from the use of neuron splitting in the solid paper. There are concepts that have a single neuron and a small model that split into like many neurons and larger models, like is hexadecimal digit to is zero in hexadecimal, because are ah, namespace collisions. But yeah, any final submissions for future work you want to see someone go pick up? I think we got through a lot there. Yeah. So I think that, yeah, just. A reminding that the first thing was um, gradient-based methods on edges feel exciting to me, but uh, then uh, Neil had a ton of great ideas as well, and uh, that's all that I can think of at the moment. Yeah, a hard idea I would love to see someone take up is thinking about what automatic feature elicitation might look like. Well, by feature elicitation, I mean not just producing a sparse cell graph, but actually telling us, like, this is the feature being represented by this edge. Mm -hmm. This is like position or name or something like that. I know Alex Varangian has a post on input swap graphs. That seems like an interesting start here. But to me, this seems like a really big bottleneck that many approaches to dis discovering circuits just kind of like ignores. Yeah, I guess that's what I think we're really going to need to get better at if we want to use Mechantup to be useful in practice. To give like a like a reference to similar works to this, which I think are like super valuable and could be combined with it actually. There's a good blog post from Alex Fee on like input swap graphs to discover like the semantics of nodes, which ATD just gives you what the nodes are rather than their semantics. Then there's also like work from Atticus Geiger on like doing this like DAS technique in order to like actually verify like the algorithms that models perform. And I think of this as like somewhere later down the line to where like this ACDC approach is, but it's still pretty cool to like automatically be checking by just a gradient descent method, what the sort of like semantics of the like algorithm are. And so uh, I think that's cool. And then it's also worth noting that the like open AI work on using GPT-4 to label GPT-2 neurons is like, a, again, very scalable approach because language models are just getting more and more powerful to like describing the semantics of the internal components of models so that's like i guess how i see other circuit work as related to this and to me at least mostly seem to complement each other because this is just about finding structure in acdc but there are a ton of ways that people have already thought about how to add like semantics to this approach and those seem like a massive massive fraction of the sort of like whole interpretability pipeline like structure and then semantics so the, those are some other works that are related to this and i think generally complement it rather than like compete with it yeah if people want to learn more about atticus's work they can go check out my walkthrough with him i have too many walkthroughs i've said that too many <laughs> times uh great all right we should probably wrap up here thanks so much for joining me and thanks for the great work thanks neil and i uh, hope that was an interesting uh discussion it's a good time talking about it yeah